the immune system defends against most diseases, but sometimes it needs a helping hand. Greg Winter's work in protein engineering led the way. I was his supervisor, and I was absolutely sure he was going to be great. Well, of course, of course you can. Brian Hartley supervised both Greg Winter and Michael Neuberger. Being lucky, we're, we're, we're all pretty bright. In those early days, no one knew how important Greg's work would become to the world of medicine. What odds would you have been putting in 1985 or 1986 that we'd end up anything like where we are now in the antibody therapeutics? The thing that convinced me that these were going to be fantastically important therapeutics was the effect it had on the first patient. We didn't know whether it might have some dire consequence. You're suddenly confronted with this is the real world, this is the real world of medicine, Pe people have to make those decisions. Greg's love of science began at an early age. I had a chemistry set as a boy. My brother and I used to play around with it. I think he set the bedroom on fire once. I can remember an experiment we did which in fact involved some biology. We put a wasp in a tube and then we fed oxygen into the tube. And then the wasp would buzz furiously when you pumped in the oxygen. And uh, then we realised we could actually quench the buzzing if we put a slug of carbon dioxide in. So we tried this alternating cycle. I remember of oxygen and carbon dioxide, oxygen and carbon dioxide. And in fact, we, in the end, we let the wasp go after about 10 cycles of this. This passion for experimentation continued, but Greg began focusing on more fundamental questions. The problems in chemistry tended to really be things I didn't really want to know the answer to. I was actually more interested in, you might say, the deep structure of, of life and how, how you get at it. Proteins are the very essence of the structure of life. But how did they evolve and how are they made? We had tried making proteins by taking random bits of protein, mm. culled from all sorts of proteins and throwing them together, and then selecting for those things that fold. But there may not be a unique way of getting a protein to fold, I mean. No, but the question of how but, but there are a number of favoured ways of doing it. The point is that proteins do fold. He's shown that random sequences will evolve to bind metal ions. Look at all that zinc. Greg Winter dedicated the early part of his career to unravelling the secrets of a particular set of proteins, enzymes. Without enzymes, most reactions could not take place at all. He invented protein engineering. He discovered and made humanised antibodies, which are now capable of curing cancer and all sorts of other diseases. He's also actually, in my opinion, going to solve the problems of the origins of life. <laughs> And that's quite a lot for a young chap. What I got from Brian was the excitement about doing something different, the excitement about speculating about possible experiment or the possible way life might work. And we don't see so much of that now. Brian, one of the wonderful things you have, I think, is enthusiasm and... Uh, sure. So yeah, you need in, to be curious, way, but you also need to be critical. But in, in a way, the future of science depends on that. It depends yeah. on people having the dreams, but having the analytical power to, 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 to actually interrogate their dreams. Once they've had them, say, actually, that was a silly exactly. dream. Exactly, and go on silly to another. Dream. Exactly, I completely yes. agree. Plus, plus five years of hard work before you get there. Greg Winter spent his PhD working out the sequence of an enzyme called tRNA synthetase. Then in the 70s, Fred Sanger's new DNA sequencing technique revolutionised protein research. At that stage, uh, Fred was full, but he passed me to um, George Brownlee, and he felt that it was very important to work on things relevant to human health. And I think that was the first influence I had in getting me thinking about not just the earliest days of evolution, which is where I'd been tending to think about with Brian, but on what you could do to make a difference. The idea had been raised to change the sequence of a protein or to change the sequence of a virus and to see what the effect is. In that way, you'd be able to tell directly what the relationship is between the, um, the structure and the sequence of the protein and, and, and its function. With Brownlee, Greg worked on influenza virus, but with that work nearing completion and his funds running low, he went back to see Fred Sanger. Fred said, well, we can probably find you a bit of money if you, if, if you want. R write a proposal. So I said, what sort of proposal? 
He said, well, write out what you want to do. So I said, you mean just this experiment or, or longer or the rest of my life? You know, it was very, very imprecise. He said, oh, the rest of your life will do. I said, well, when do you want that by? No, oh, tomorrow morning. Can you type it out and um, have it on my desk tomorrow morning? I was able to put down the idea that I was going to do protein engineering. This was even before I'd done it. The true discipline of a chemist is you analyse the structure and when you think that you understand it, then you synthesise it. I want to build new proteins. Maybe what we need is to have something which is kind of a scaffold. And at that point, I was looking at a number of possible scaffolds. One possibility was antibodies. In nature, antibodies adapt to changing invasive antigens. That's why Greg thought antibodies might provide a good test bed for building new proteins. If you took the, the, the loops from one antibody that bind to the antigen and you put those onto the framework of another antibody, basically, if that's simply a passive framework, then you should be able to transplant the activity. Virtually all the antibodies described till then were mouse antibodies. Uh, you were working on, at that stage, making chimeric antibodies, in fact, interest in the possibility of making therapeutics. You know, I'm quite sure that must have influenced me in some way to think, well, why transfer it from one mouse antibody to another? Why not transfer it from a mouse antibody to a human antibody? Because if that succeeded, then not only would that answer the fundamental question about whether this thing was a real framework, but it would provide a way of humanising antibodies which might be therefore useful therapeutically. In the 1980s, Greg developed his technique for humanising animal antibodies and patients began to be treated. We set up this experiment uh, where we made the humanised Campath antibodies, so turned his rat antibody into effectively almost a human antibody. What they said is, well, would you like to meet the patient? But for God's sake, don't put on your lab coat saying Medical Research Council. She'll think she's being experimented on. Um, so I went across there, you know, in my scruffy old jeans and pullover, and there was a lovely lady there who'd had it. Um, and in fact, it, 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 after 30 days of treatment, it greatly shrank this tumour. And um, I got talking to her, and she would be sitting there knitting. And um, I was really quite touched by her. And um, I remember thinking, if you could, you know, actually, here we are as scientists. Do you know, sometimes we can do things that make a difference. This poor lady can't do anything. She's completely at the mercy of the cancer that she's got. But actually, we can do it. We can do something about it. The feeling is so intense and immense and so on, you, 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 you feel a little bit like God, I can see. The first thing you do is go and hammer your head on the wall saying, why didn't I think of that before? Yeah, think how stupid That's the first, how yeah, stupid, how stupid I was. But sometimes, you know, people, people claim that's why they do science for these, for these big right. moments. But actually, that would be a very strange you kind of junkie. A you strange, do. no, no, it would be a very strange You're not junkie. Just making money, a, stra Greg. No, a strange junkie. <laughs> if every ten years or twenty years you get a high. Now that that we're not that mad. So actually, there must be lots of things that keep us going. Oh, they're little highs. Oh, and little, they're little. You get little highs, and actually, you have an intellectual satisfaction from doing it, don't you? You have a great idea, and then you've got to oh, grind, grind through, away. grind away. But that's worth it when you you know you get the kick out of achieving it.